Disclaimer, I do not have all the answers, nor do I claim to have all the answers. Do not treat what I say as gospel and do not use it to talk down to aspiring writers. I'm just summarizing other people's ideas. Check the description for more information and now on with the video. Today, we'll be discussing story structure, one of the most popular subjects among fiction writers, but also one of the most hotly contested, as no two writers can agree on what exactly makes story structure work. For example, what is more important, plot or character? This debate goes all the way back to Greek theater when Aristotle, in his notes, The Poetics, he said that plot was more important than character. But later on, the playwrights all said that character determined the plot, and this was even reflected in Leos Egri's The Art of Dramatic Writing. But even still, the American realism writer Henry James said that what is plot but a determination of character, and what is a character but the realization of a plot? Or going further out, what's more important, the way a story is told or the subject of the story itself? I discuss these ideas in my videos on literary theory and cultural critical theory, but in a nutshell, one side says that the subject of a story is more important, and on the other side, especially the formalism, structuralism, and modernism side, the way you tell the story is more important. And on top of all that, there are dozens and dozens of writing guides that give out contradictory information about what constitutes a good story. Do you pick Freytag's Pyramid, the prologue, rising action, climax, falling action, epilogue? Or do you pick the three-act structure that puts the climax in Act 3? Yet still, other models of three-act structure divide Act 2 into Act 2A and Act 2B. So I guess those who use three-act structure have to ask themselves, to be or not to be? Or do you use the hero's journey? You start a hero in an ordinary world, they go to the special world to collect some sort of boon or elixir, they have a death and rebirth, then they return to the ordinary world transformed, or you can further divide the special world into the descent into the special world and the death and rebirth, or do what Channel 101's Dan Harmon did and divide it even further into eight steps in what he calls the story circle. Who are you? What is your need? You go into the special world, you look in the special world to see what works, you find what you were looking for, you pay the price of going to the special world, you return and recover, and finally you change. Or going even further out, we got the Stein and Glenn model of narrative, which John Truby simplifies in The Anatomy of Story. And instead of an act structure, we get what do the characters want, their goal, who's to get in the way, their opponents, and what is their plan to get it, the plan, usually based on a weakness, need, or ghost from their backstory. Instead of an act two, we get the battle. The plans clash with each other, creating the narrative drive. Eventually, we get a new equilibrium, and if the character has an arc, they usually have a self-revelation. Or you have the value shift model, most popular from Robert McKee's story, but also championed by Kurt Vonnegut, Christopher Booker in his book The Seven Basic Plots, and Hayden White in his concept of emplotment. According to them, a good story just shifts from bad to good or good to bad. In Kurt Vonnegut's example of the man in a hole plot, guy's going along his day, suddenly ends up in a hole, gets out of the hole, people love that story. Or every episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. The Eds are down on their luck, they find a scam that works, suddenly it doesn't work. People love that episode! And yet, despite all this talk of story structure, there are still dozens of books out there that say you don't even necessarily need structure, all you need is inspiration and the story will follow. And people use these and still manage to write good material. So the question is, how do we even write a good story with so much contradictory advice? I say, let's pause for a moment and ask a very important question. What even is a story? I know that sounds like a dumb question, but you really have to ask yourself, what is a story? What do all these guides have in common? To figure that out, let's ask the science of narrative, narratology. Yes, there's an actual field of study that asks, what even is a story? In her paper, Towards a Definition of Narrative, narratologist marie Laura Ryan outlines eight principles across four dimensions of what defines a narrative. You have the spatial dimension, it is a story world inhabited by characters. The temporal dimension, that story world and characters undergoes change, and it is by a non-habitual event. It's something that doesn't normally happen within this story world. You have the mental dimension, the characters may react, or they may also act upon the events that happen. And then you have the formal dimension, it is a series of casually connected events, one that affects the other, that eventually ends in closure. It's something that actually happened, it can't be a dream sequence or an imagining, and it must be something that communicates something meaningful to the audience. In a similar vein, we have the cognitive narratologist David Herman and his four basic elements of story. Situatedness, how is the story being told to what audience in what way on what medium? 
the event sequencing, in what order are the events told, which will affect our perception of the story as an audience, the world making and world disruption of the story, how do we establish a story world, the settings and the characters, then how can we disrupt that story world to create story events, and then finally, what it's like, or is what the natural narratologist Monica Flutternick calls experientiality. How do we, the audience, experience this story the same way the characters do? To throw my own hat into the ring, I mixed all these definitions together and came up with my own definition of a story, which I hope you will find practical. A story is a representation of a story world undergoing disruption in a meaningful way, in a certain style, for a target audience. Let's break that down. A representation, on what medium do you tell it, of a story world, what is the setting and characters, undergoing disruption, something out of the ordinary happens, even in slice of life there are disruptions, in a meaningful way, there's a theme and or experientiality, we get to feel what the characters feel, in a certain style that includes tone and storytelling techniques, for a target audience, who are you telling the story for? With those definitions in mind, let's look at how all the moving parts work together. And for that, we turn to narratologist Seymour Chapman. In his book, Story and Discourse, he says that all narrative texts are made of a story and a discourse, what the Russian formalists previously called the fabula and the chazette. The story is, what is it about? And the discourse is, how do you structure it? Now, when I say structure, I don't necessarily mean like acts and scenes. I mean stuff like, do we have flashbacks, flash forwards? Do we have first person, third person, that kind of thing? So if we're going to look at how do we structure the events, let's look deeper into what the story is made out of. The story itself is made of events and existence, also known as the story world. This includes the settings and the characters. Now, you can build a vast setting with a bunch of characters, but that still won't give you a plot. To build a plot, we need events, so let's take a closer look at that. The two basic event types are actions and happenings. Actions, what other narratologists call kernels or nuclei, are events that disrupt the story world in long-lasting and impactful ways. Happenings, also known as satellites and catalyzers, do not disrupt the story world, but instead dramatize the changes that happen because of the actions. For future reference, I prefer the term kernels and satellites, so I'll refer to major change scenes as kernels and scenes that illustrate the changes as satellites. To see this in action, let's look at this example story. We got three satellite scenes that show the world as is. Then we get one positive kernel scene where things change for the better. And now we got three satellite scenes showing the changes in action. But then, boom, we get a negative kernel scene. Now we have four satellite scenes showing the negative changes. And then a positive change and so on and so forth. But things can still go wrong if you repeat too many of the same event types in a row. For example, what makes a Mary Sue or Marty Stu story bad? It's not the character. It's because their stories all look like this. They start out in the ordinary world, they go to where the story takes place, and then they meet a new character, they meet a new character, they solve a new problem, they meet a new character, they meet a new character, repeat, repeat, repeat. You also have the opposite problem of too many kernel scenes in a row. It'll exhaust you, the writer, coming up with so many changes to your story world, and it'll exhaust the audience trying to keep up with these changes. So you need to mix up the changes with dramatizing the changes. But probably the most common issue when it comes to satellites and kernels is when the kernels don't reflect the satellites or the satellites don't reflect the kernels. For example here, we do have negative kernels and positive kernels, but then we have a bunch of satellite scenes that have nothing to do with them. When people say the story is full of filler or padding, this is what they're talking about. Traditionally, the way you would fix this is by getting rid of all these satellite scenes and immediately cutting to the interesting parts, but there's another way to do this. Instead of cutting the scenes, you can repurpose them so they reflect the kernels. This way, you don't have to cut anything, you can have a more dynamic story, and you get a little extra world building and character development. And before I run out of time, let's look at the structure of an event itself. This is William Labov's Diamond, a good way of looking at the structure of events, but also a good way of looking at stories as a whole. We begin with the abstract, under what context is the story being told, such as the genre, the medium, the audience, and so on. Then we get the orientation, we establish the story world, where we find out who are the characters, where is it taking place, when is it taking place, under what circumstances. Then we get the complication, we get the disruption to the story world, the evaluation 
animation is how the characters act or react, and they can do multiple things, which is why we have that little arrow there. Eventually, we get a resolution, how did things turn out? We get a coda, what was the point of that scene? And the cycle repeats. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so let's wrap things up. What do all of the different story structures have in common? They're all basically patterns of scenes that change a story world and then scenes that dramatize that change. They're alternating patterns of kernels and satellites, of nuclei and catalyzers, of actions and happenings. The constant cycle of orientation, complication, evaluation, and resolution. If we can look at these patterns, then we can put all of these into practice. We can apply it to three-act structure. We can apply it to the hero's journey. We can even apply it to improvising our writing, to improvising in theater, to even improvising in role playing. Now, how to apply that will be a subject for another video. In the meantime, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll see you all later and good luck in your writing endeavors.